Good morning, and welcome to the online worship service of Garner Evangelical Free Church. This morning, let me just begin the service by reading this um, really encouraging psalm, Psalm 62. It's a psalm of David, and, and he writes, For God alone my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be greatly shaken. How long will all of you attack a man to batter him? like a leaning wall, a tottering fence, the only plan to thrust him down from his high position, to take pleasure in falsehood. They bless with their mouths, but inwardly they curse. For God alone, O oh my soul, wait in silence, for my hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my salvation and my glory. My mighty rock, my refuge is God. Trust in him at all times, O oh people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Those of low estate are but a breath. Those of high estate are a delusion. In the balances they go up. They are together lighter than a breath. Put no trust in extortion. Set no vain hopes on robbery. If riches increase, do not set your heart on them. Once God has spoken, twice have I heard this, that power belongs to God, and that to you, O oh Lord, belongs steadfast love for you will render to a man according to his work. Thank you for, for tuning in this morning so that together we can worship the God who is our rock and our salvation and our fortress. He is the one to whom power belongs and steadfast love. And so in this difficult time that we're facing as a nation and even as a church family, we can trust in him. Trust in him at all times. Oh, people, pour out your heart before him. Why? Because God is a refuge for us. And so we're here to worship him together this morning. And as we begin, let me just share some announcements. Um, first of all, we have created an online prayer board where you can go to, po to post prayer requests and to read and pray for the, for the prayer requests from others in our church family. Um, there's a link in the uh, announcements that were sent out to you yesterday. And so I would just encourage you to go and check those, um, ch to check that prayer board t twice or three times a week. And we can pray together for one another and for all the requests that are posted there. And if you have something that you would like all of us to be praying for, please feel free to add that to that prayer board. The Youth Pastor Search Committee uh, would love to get input from the congregation as they work on putting together a new job description. And so this past Wednesday or Friday, Maybe it is Thursday. You should have received an email um, inviting you to fill out a survey. And in that survey, you can just, um, th there's a lot of questions um, that give you an opportunity to provide input about um, what you would like to see in the new youth pastor. And so um, I would encourage you, if you haven't had a chance to do that yet, to go back to your emails from, I believe it is Thursday, and click on the link there, and just to take um, a few minutes to fill that out. If you could get that done by this Wednesday, April 1st, we would certainly appreciate that. GoServe Global has postponed their annual banquet and fundraiser. It is originally scheduled for this Friday night, April 3rd. They're going to have that, Lord willing, on August 15th instead. But this Friday night at 7 p.m., they are going to be hosting a, a Facebook Live event, and they would love for us all to tune in and be part of that. And so, um, again, the... Uh, and the website is listed in the announcements that you received yesterday by email. Our church is taking care of serving at God's Pantry during the month of March. And so we have one more day that, um, that we're serving there. And that's tomorrow from 9 to 11 a.m. If you are able to help uh, with God's Pantry tomorrow morning, please uh, contact Pat Teeter. She would love to have you help out. Um, they need extra help right now because they are using a drive through service rather than having people come in to the church. And so if you're willing to help, please contact Pat Teeter, and she would love to get you involved with that ministry. It's just a great way to help people in our community right now. Hidden Acres Bible Camp is still hoping to have Bible camps for kids this summer. And if you have a child or, or several children that are of camp age and would like to go, there are scholarship monies available through the church, and we would love to help you to be able to send your kid to Bible or, or your kids to Bible camp this summer. So by April 30th, please talk to Elizabeth Baxter. Her email address is 
in the bulletin or in the announcements that you receive. Um, it's garnerefree at gmail.com, and we would love to help uh, with, with the cost of Bible camp. Also, as we go through 1 Thessalonians uh, on Sunday mornings in the sermons, um, I would love for, for many of you to um, take the, the time that we have right now as we're at home more and there aren't other activities going on in life, I would love for you to take the time to really dig into the Word and to dig into this great book of 1 Thessalonians. And so um, you can find online this uh, little Bible study book um, from Pathway Bible Guides. It's called Standing Firm, uh, 1 Thessalonians. And so if you have a chance, you can go to Amazon or ChristianBook.com or um, TenOfThose.com and you can find it for under $7 there. In the coming weeks, we would love to have... Um, just an online uh, kind of chat room where we can discuss uh, that Bible study throughout the week. Pat Teeter has come up with a great way to help families and kids to continue learning God's Word while we can't have uh, Sunday school on Sunday mornings. Um, parents, we can still teach our children the Word of God. And so Pat has a four-week uh, Bible study for kids that she's making available for, for all of us. Um, if you'd like to receive a packet, please contact Pat at... Um, 641-425-9818 and she would love to drop that by your house. She'll just leave it on the porch, leave it outside for you. Um, our kids have started doing that here at our house and um, and they're really enjoying it. Um, just some great activities, great things for them to, to learn about God and his word. Our missionaries of the month for the month of, month of March are Terry and Debbie Baxter and they would just love for us to, pr to pray for their Ghosts of Global staff as they send teams around the world and as they need support for the many orphanages, churches, Christian schools, medical centers that they have in several different countries, um, there's so much good ministry that happens through Ghost Serve Global. And obviously this is a, this is a difficult time, um, not only here in the United States, but also in many different countries throughout the world. And the missionaries and staff of Ghost Serve still need um, that financial support. And so let's just be praying for them in the coming week that God would really bless that ministry and enable them to continue to spread the gospel in the coming weeks and months. So with that in mind, let's just take some time right now to go to the Lord in prayer and lift our hearts before him. And I'm so thankful that we have a God who hears us, a Father who loves us, and, and we can cry out to him for mercy, knowing that our Father loves to hear the cries of his children. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we bow before you this morning and we praise you that you are our rock and our salvation and our fortress. Father, we thank you that we can come to you knowing that to you belongs all the power. Lord, you are the one filled with steadfast love and so in good times and bad, in hard times and in easy times, you are the God that we need. You are the God that we cling to. And so, Father, I pray that right now in this difficult time, for our country and really for the whole world as this coronavirus pandemic is spreading. Lord, we pray that you'd help us to trust you. Would you strengthen our faith in you, Lord? I pray that you would help us to not be overcome with fear, but help us to bring our fears to you and to trust you as the God who cares for us and who loves us, as the God who is sovereign and in control. Help us to pour out our hearts before you, Lord. Thank you that Psalm 62 invites us to do that, that we can come to you with all of our cares and worries and anxieties. And so would you just help us, give us confidence to come to you as children coming to our loving Father and pouring on our hearts to you. Father, I pray that you would help us to, to represent you well, even in this season. Help us to share the love of Christ and the hope of the gospel with the world around us. And Father, we pray that there would be an end to the spread of the coronavirus. Lord, we pray that, that you would put a stop to it. Lord, I know that so many missionaries are being hindered in their work because of this. It's hard to advance the gospel during uh, the spread of a pandemic. And so, Lord, we pray that for the sake of the gospel, that you would put an end to the coronavirus and that the work of missions could go forward, the work of evangelization could go forward. Father, we pray that sooner than later, that you would enable us as a church to continue to, to meet together face to face. And so, Lord, for the sake of your name and for the sake of the gospel, would you put an end um, to this awful sickness? And we pray that even now in the midst of 
this pandemic, that you would work in the hearts of the lost so that they would look to you, that they would see their need for Christ and that they would see that hope is truly found in you and in you alone. We pray that many people would come to trust in Jesus Christ in this season. And so, Lord, to that end, we do pray that you would help us as your people to represent you well. Father, we pray for the places where this pande pandemic is just rampant, places like New York, and New Orleans, Italy, other places, Lord. We pray for the suffering people there, that you would have mercy on them. And we just ask that you would be, be glorified as you bring people to Christ. Father, we pray for, for Lisa, our sister in Christ, Lisa May, as she's managing the, the COVID testing site in Mason City. Lord, would you please be gracious to, to protect her and the other medical personnel that are working there. We pray that you would keep them from getting sick. We pray that you'd help them to care well for the people that come there. And Lord, we do pray for a special protection around the people in our area. Lord, we would just love for you to protect the people here uh, locally, here in North Central Iowa, so that this pandemic would, would, would not spread uh, too terribly much here. Lord, we do pray for those in our community, in our, in our county and, and the surrounding counties that are suffering with this, that you would bring healing to them, that you would encourage their hearts, that you would help them to trust in you, Lord. Father, we pray for our sister Anne Heath as she's dealing with such terrible back pain. Lord, we ask that you would bring healing to her and that you would help her to be able to um, get back on her feet soon. And so, Lord, would you be near to, to Anne and to Mike and encourage their hearts through this, um, through this difficult season and bring relief and healing. And so, Father, would you encourage our hearts this morning? Would you help us to really draw near to you? Even in this season, Father, may we grow in our relationship with you. May we grow in our relationships with one another. We pray that even this time of absence from the, from the fellowship of the, of the church would help us to really value and to, to prize the gift of fellowship with one another that you've given us. And so would you knit our hearts closer and closer together in love for one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. And may we love you more. And so thank you, Father. Would you continue to, to speak to us and to bless us in this time as we worship you. We pray this all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Now is the time that we typically take the offering. And... Obviously, we can't do that physically right now, and so I just want to remind you that even in this season that the expenses of the church do continue, and so I would just encourage you to, to give as the Lord leads. Um, there's a couple options, a couple different ways that you can do that. Um, first of all, you can mail a check to the church at P.O. Box 184 in Garner. The other option is to sign up for electronic tithing, and um, in the announcement uh, email that you received yesterday, uh, there was a document attached to that that would enable you to fill that out and you just mail it into the church and then we can get you signed up for e-giving. Our fighter verse for uh, this week is Galatians 6.14. Such a great verse about what life is really all about. Let's read this together. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. We have nothing else to boast in except the cross of Christ. Jesus laid down his life for us on the cross, and that's the reason why we have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. It's all because of Christ. And so may it never be that we would boast in ourselves or in our possessions or our own achievements. May we boast only in Christ and his cross. Right now is the, the time that we're going to look into God's word. And so if you have your Bible with you, uh, I would encourage you to turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. If you don't have your Bible with you, you can even um, just take, take a moment right now and go grab your Bible. And um, we're going to be looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. We'll be digging into verses 9 through 12 this morning. I'll read that passage. The Apostle Paul writes, For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil. We worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaimed to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward you believers. For you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God, who calls you 
into his own kingdom and glory. Let's pray together once again. And so, Father, as we look into your word now, I pray that you would encourage each one of our hearts. We need encouragement in this season, and Lord, you, you've given us your word for many reasons, and one of those is to provide encouragement. And so, Lord, I pray that you would speak to each one of our hearts, that you would challenge us, and that you would also encourage us, and that you would help us to walk faithfully with you so that you would be glorified in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The first half of 1 Thessalonians 2 is really a fascinating passage of Scripture because it tells us so much about how the Apostle Paul carried out his ministry. Reading this passage is almost like being able to, to look through a window and to see Paul at work sharing Christ, spreading the gospel, and building up the church. Last week, of course, we looked at the first eight verses in 1 Thessalonians 2. And we saw that Paul and his missionary team did not come to Thessalonica with bad motives or, or selfish motives. No, their, their gospel ministry was motivated by a desire to please God and by a, by a selfless love for people. Now in verses 9 through 12, Paul is going to continue to, to tell us about how he and his missionary team lived and how they taught and how they represented Christ during their time in Thessalonica. I think there's so much for us to learn in this passage, not only about Paul and his ministry, but even about the gospel itself and about the Christian life and about the gospel story that, that really defines our lives. And so as we walk through this passage, we're going to learn about three main things today. First of all, the free grace of the gospel. Secondly, our calling to live lives that bear witness to the gospel. And then thirdly, we're going to learn about how the gospel story ought to shape our lives and help us to walk in a manner worthy of God. And so Paul begins in verse 9 by saying, For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil. We worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaimed to you the gospel of God. And so Paul and his missionary team made sure that they wouldn't be a burden to any of the Thessalonians. Now what does that mean? What kind of burden is Paul talking about here? Well, he's talking about being a financial burden. Paul did not want to be dependent on the financial gifts of the people that he was trying to reach with the gospel. You see this also in Paul's second letter to the Thessalonians, chapter 3, verse 8. He writes there, Nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it, but with toil and labor we worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. Paul and his team paid for their own food so that they wouldn't be a financial burden to the Thessalonians. And in order to not be a burden, they worked really hard. They worked night and day in order to earn their own living while they were in Thessalonica. The book of Acts tells us that Paul was a tent maker by trade, and tent making was a very difficult job. It was really hard manual labor. But everywhere that Paul traveled, he supported himself by, by making tents and selling those tents. His policy was to, to not receive funds from the people that he was evangelizing. Paul was only willing to receive gifts from established ch churches and Christians who had already been walking with the Lord. And this was really an important part of Paul's evangelistic strategy. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 9, he talks about this in depth, how he really is intent on not receiving money from people that he's trying to, to reach with the gospel. He says in 1 Corinthians 9, verses 18 and 19, What then is my reward? That in my preaching I may present the gospel free of charge, so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel. For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. Apparently, Paul believed that by not taking money from non-believers, he would actually be able to win more non-believers to Christ. Now, how does that work? <laughs> well, for one thing, like we saw last week, Paul wanted to make sure to distance himself from other traveling speakers and other traveling teachers. He didn't want non-believers to see him taking their money 
for preaching the gospel and to think that he was just a, another traveling snake oil salesman. But besides that, Paul wanted to present the gospel free of charge because God's offer of salvation is free of charge. Eternal life is a free gift from God. We can't earn it. We can't buy it. We can only receive it as a free gift. Paul says in Romans 3, verses 23 and 24, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift. Literally, it says, as a free gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Our salvation is free. It is absolutely free to be received as a gift. But the fact that it's free doesn't mean that it's cheap. In fact, our salvation is infinitely costly. We could never pay a high enough price for our salvation. But you know what? Jesus Christ paid the price for us on the cross. In 1 Peter 1, it says, You were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. The Son of God gave his life. That is the infinite price that had to be paid so that we can be saved. There's nothing that we can contribute to our salvation. I mean, if Jesus laid down his life, what could we possibly add to that payment? God offers us eternal life for free. Jesus has already paid the price by dying for the sins of all who will trust in him. And so the only way for us to respond to this, to this incredibly gracious offer is by receiving Christ, receiving the forgiveness of sins, receiving the gift of everlasting life by putting our faith in Jesus. If you've never done that before, then I want to invite you this morning to receive the most precious gift of all by simply trusting Jesus as the one who died and rose to save you. Isn't it wonderful? Isn't it wonderful and amazing that the that salvation is free, and that the gospel is free. You know, the federal government just approved a bill to spend $2 trillion to help the country through the coronavirus pandemic. And that is a gigantic amount of money. I can't even get my mind around that, $2 trillion. But you know what? Eternal life is worth infinitely more than that. It is worth infinitely more than than trillions and trillions of dollars. To spend eternity with God, instead of being separated from him in hell, that is priceless. And on the cross, the Son of God paid the price so that we could have everlasting life. And for everyone who believes in him, he has given us our salvation as a free gift. What an amazing Savior. And so Paul labored to present the gospel free of charge because the gospel itself is a gift that is free of charge. And now in verse 10, Paul is going to show, show us that he labored to present the gospel with integrity. He writes, You are witnesses, and God also, how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward you believers. The way that Paul and his missionary team treated the Thessalonians was holy and righteous and blameless. Just think about each one of those. First of all, they conducted themselves in a way that was holy. That means they honored God. They lived in a way that was pleasing to the Lord. And since they honored God, they also treated people, secondly, in a way that was right or, or righteous. If you remember the story in Acts 17 of how Paul and his friends brought the gospel to Thessalonica, you remember that they were accused of being criminals. They were accused of acting against the, dec the decrees of Caesar by proclaiming Jesus as the king. The truth, of course, is that they weren't committing treason. They weren't trying to overthrow the emperor. No, everything that they did was righteous. And so Paul and his team lived in a way that was holy and, and righteous. And then thirdly, they were blameless in their conduct. It doesn't mean that they were perfectly sinless, but that they lived in a way that was above reproach. There was nothing bad that anyone could truly say about them. And the Thessalonian believers knew this. Verse 10 says, You are witnesses. 
You've seen it with your own eyes. You are witnesses. And God also of how holy and righteous and, and blameless our conduct was when we were there in Thessalonica. In other words, Paul and his missionary team lived with integrity when they were in public and when they were alone. Whether there were a hundred people watching them or if only God was watching them. They lived with integrity. My dad was a high school choir director for, for almost 40 years in the same school. And once there was a problem that arose in that school because of something that a certain teacher had done, but nobody knew which teacher was responsible for it. And somehow a rumor arose and, and started to spread that, that my dad might have been the culprit. And what happened is that everyone who heard that rumor said, that can't be. Don Anderson would never do that. Eventually, the culprit was found. And everybody was right. Don Anderson was innocent. You know what? That's how Paul and his missionary team lived their lives. They had such integrity that any charges against them just wouldn't stick. And when Paul mentions this in verse 10, he's not boasting. He's just bringing this up because it's part of his witness for the gospel. If Paul and his friends had been shady characters, very few people would have believed their message. But they lived their lives in a way that verified the truth of the gospel message. They lived in a way that people could say, you know what, I've seen how Paul and Silas and Timothy and all of their friends live their lives. These men really love God. They're upright. They are blameless. I have to believe that the message that they're preaching is true. Isn't this what we want the world to be able to say about us? Everything that we do, whether we're in public or alone, whether a hundred people are watching or if only God is watching, it's all part of our witness for Christ. We don't want our lives to push people away from Christ. Instead, we want our lives to give undeniable testimony to the truth of the gospel. Now, as we move into verses 11 and 12, Paul is going to remind the Thessalonians that this really is how he taught them to live. He taught them to commend the gospel with their lives. He taught them to walk in a manner worthy of God. Verses 11 and 12. For you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. If you remember from last week, back in verses 7 and 8, Paul described his ministry in terms of a, a nursing mother taking care of her children. Paul was gentle towards these new believers in Thessalonica. He cared for their needs. He loved them with a selfless love. Now in verses 11 and 12, he is describing his ministry by using the picture of a father speaking to his children. And specifically, he's speaking to them to exhort them, secondly, to encourage them, and thirdly, to charge them to walk in a manner worthy of God. And so let's just take a minute to think about those three things. First of all, Paul exhorted, he admonished these new believers like a father. All of us who are fathers have probably had many talks with our children where we've told them, you know what's right. Your mother and I have taught you the right thing to do. Now you need to do it. Paul did that with these believers. He not only taught them how to live as God's people, but he also challenged them and he urged them to walk in obedience. Secondly, he, he encouraged them. Think of a father encouraging his children. This is certainly a, a really important part of our, of our role as dads, isn't it? I love what Pastor Sam Crabtree writes in his book, Parenting with Loving Correction. He says, One of the most powerful reflections of God's kindness, generosity, and love will be the consistent affirmation you give your child. Good correcting must be preceded by lots and lots of good affirmation. Saying yes first is crucial to expressing an effective no later. Consistent affirmation from parent to child will gain a hearing so that the parent's later correction will be heard. That's what Paul did with these new believers in Thessalonica. You can imagine him saying, you're doing well, keep it up. God is working in your lives. He's transforming you. 
Keep on growing in the Lord. You're doing great. And then thirdly, think of a father charging his children. He says, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God. Maybe you would imagine a father having a really a serious talk with one of his kids, sitting down and saying, you know what, it is really important for you to obey mom and dad. When your friends start getting into trouble, don't go along with them. This is really important. It's for your good. I want you to obey because I love you. And so this is how Paul ministered to the Thessalonian believers. And if you think about it, this is how the word of God speaks to each one of us. The Bible exhorts us to follow Christ in obedience. It challenges us. It admonishes us. And the word of God also encourages us as believers. It tells us, your Father in heaven loves you. Jesus is with you. The Holy Spirit is living in you. God is going to help you to glorify him. He's going to strengthen you. And God also uses his word to sit us down and to charge us, to have serious conversations with us. In other words, the Bible brings conviction. When we begin to lose our way, the Bible redirects our course. It shows us how important it is to honor God in everything that we do. And so when we read the Bible, we need to pay attention to how God wants to use his word to speak into our lives. We should ask ourselves, as we're reading scripture, is this passage challenging me to step out in faith? Is it bringing some kind of encouragement to my heart? Is this passage correcting me? How should I respond to what God is teaching me today in his word? It's a really important question to ask every time we're reading the Bible. How should I respond to what God is teaching me here? And so Paul is like a good father. He spoke to these new believers. He exhorted them. He encouraged them. He charged them, as he says in verse 12, to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Now, what he says here is really rich. There is so much for us to think about here. God cares about the way that we, that we walk. Paul is using this idea of, of walking. And that means that God not only cares about what we do on Sunday morning, which, of course, is very, very important, but God also cares about what we do every moment of every day. When Paul talks about our walk, he's talking about all of life. How do you walk from one place to another? You do that one step at a time. How do you walk in a manner worthy of God? You do that one step at a time. And so this not only involves the big decisions that we make every once in a while, it involves dozens and hundreds of little decisions that we make every single day. And so Paul is challenging us here to walk, to live every moment of every day in a manner worthy of God. Now, what does that mean to walk in a manner worthy of God? Well, certainly it does not mean that God is saying to us, well, if you live well enough and follow all the rules, then you'll be worthy of me. Then you'll be welcomed in my kingdom. No, like we've seen this morning, salvation is a free gift. We can't make ourselves deserving of God's grace. Remember, of course, that Paul is writing here to people who are already believers. They've already been redeemed by the grace of Christ. They are already children of God. And so Paul is saying, you need to walk in a way that's fitting for God's people. You belong to God. You are his children. And so walk in a way that reflects who you are. Walk in a way that reflects your identity as the sons and daughters of God. Now, before we think about the specifics of what that actually looks like, we need to think about the motivation to live this way. Why should the Thessalonian Christians, and why should you and I, live in a manner worthy of God? What's the motivation? We should live this way because as it says at the end of verse 12, God calls you into his own kingdom and glory. God is the one who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Now that's a phrase that has a story behind it, isn't it? <laughs> Have you ever heard somebody say something that you didn't expect, something that really surprised you? And you think, 
There must be a story behind those words. At our district conference in Des Moines a few weeks ago, one of the speakers shared a story about how once he was in a local business there in Des Moines and he was buying something and the man working at the counter just happened to ask him what he did for a living. And he told the man that he was a pastor. And the man immediately replied by saying, well, I'm gay and I'm an atheist. And this pastor was very surprised by that response. He didn't expect that. And he thought to himself, there must be a story behind those words. And so he asked the man, so what's your story? Tell me your story. And for the next 15 minutes, he listened to this atheistic gay man share his story. And eventually, this pastor had the opportunity to share with this man the grace and the love of Christ. Here in 1 Thessalonians, verse 12 of chapter 2, Paul could have just said, We exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God. Period. End of sentence. That would have made perfect sense, and then on to verse 13. But for some reason, Paul decided to add the fact that God calls you into his own kingdom and glory. It's like a really nice surprise at the end of the sentence. We didn't expect that. And it makes you say, there must be a story behind those words. Paul's got something in mind. What is he thinking? What's the story behind this? It's a really good story. So what's the story here? Well, really, it's the story of the gospel. It's the big, overarching story of the Bible. It begins with God creating a world that's good, a world without sin and, and disease and death. And in this good world, God created human beings in his image to live in his kingdom under his kingship. But when Adam and Eve sinned, they, their sin brought sadness and sorrow and pain and death into the world. And because of sin, we need to be redeemed. And as we saw earlier, Jesus paid the price for our redemption when he died and rose to save us. And the story isn't over yet. One day, Jesus is going to return. He's going to come back, and he's going to establish his everlasting kingdom. And his kingdom is a perfect and good kingdom. Just like the original creation, there will be no sin, no disease, no death in the kingdom of God. But you know what? It's going to be even better than Eden. There will be no possibility of sin and sadness invading the new creation. And best of all, we're going to see God himself face to face. We're going to live in the presence of God for all eternity. As it says at the end of verse 12 here, God is going to actually share his glory with us. And we're going to reign with him. We're going to behold him in all of his glory. Our hearts are going to be enthralled with the majesty and beauty of God himself. And Paul says here that God calls us into his own kingdom and glory. He has called us out of this fallen, sinful world to belong to him. And it's all by his sovereign grace. Brothers and sisters, the Holy Spirit has worked in our hearts to call us to God, to bring us to repentance and faith of Christ, and faith in Christ. And it's because of his grace, it's because of God calling us to himself, that we're on our way to his glorious kingdom. This is our story. This is the story of the gospel. And it's what defines who we are. And it tells us where we're headed. It tells us our destiny. And so as believers, we need to find our identity in the story of God, the story of our redemption, the story of how God gave his son so that we could live forever in his glorious kingdom. One reason that this is so important is because the world is constantly feeding us unbiblical stories to try to shape our lives. For example, whatever's going on in the political world, that's reality. That's what matters. That's what's going to shape the future. It's going to shape your future. <laughs> no, it's not. Of course it's not. <laughs> right now, of course, the, the story that's dominating the world is the, is the story of the coronavirus. Now, of course, we shouldn't be ignorant. I'm not saying that we should pay no attention to what's going on. No, it's good for us to stay informed. But if the story of the coronavirus is dominating our lives, 
and if it's what we co- what we're constantly thinking about, then we're going to be pretty hopeless. Praise God that the story of a pandemic spreading throughout the world is not what defines our lives. Our lives are defined by the story of the gospel spreading throughout the world. And this gospel has spread to us. And it is the ultimate vaccine against death and hell. And even now, we have the opportunity to spread this gospel to a world that's in need of a savior. And because of the gospel, we're on our way to a glorious future in the new heavens and the new earth. Our story has a happy ending, an infinitely happy ending. And when this gospel story is what shapes our minds and our hearts, and we see ourselves as God's people who have been saved by his grace and called into his kingdom and glory, then we'll actually begin to live as God's people, saved by his grace, called into his kingdom and glory. In other words, in order for us to walk in a manner worthy of God, We need to stop allowing the world to define who we are. And instead, we need to allow the story of the gospel to define who we are. The more that we understand our identity in Christ as God's beloved people, the more that we understand the hope that we have, then the more that we'll live in a way that's fitting for people who have been rescued from this present evil age and who are on our way into God's kingdom and glory. And so now with all that in mind, let's think through how this actually works. Let's think through some very specific ways that understanding our place in God's story helps us to walk in a manner worthy of God. And so what should our hearts love? Well, if if we are God's redeemed people, if that's our identity, then we shouldn't be in love with this world or the things of this world. Our hearts should love God above everything else. We should find our joy and our delight most of all in him. We should also love the people created in his image. Then how should we relate to our fellow Christians? Well, if if we are pilgrims walking on the same road into God's eternal kingdom and glory, then as fellow travelers on that road, we should love one another. We should be at peace with one another. We should encourage and, and help one another on the journey. We should care for one another as brothers and sisters in Christ members of God's eternal family. How should we relate to the unbelieving world around us? Well, the story of the gospel tells us that we are representatives of God in this world. We are ambassadors for Christ. We've been sent by the king to invite people into his kingdom. How should we respond to temptation and sin? Well, as children of God, it's, it's not fitting for us to turn back to our old sinful ways. And so we should seek the help of the Holy Spirit to help us to to live as God's holy people, to live lives that are worthy of God. What should we put our hope in? Well, our hope is not in this world. Our hope is not in living for ourselves and getting all that we can out of this world. But we can live for eternity with the joyful hope that we're on our way to everlasting glory. Where do we find guidance for our lives? The Word of God provides the guidance we need. As it says in verse 12, the word of God exhorts us and encourages us and charges us to walk in a manner worthy of God. It teaches us everything that we need to know about God and about ourselves and about how to please him with our lives. See, everything in our lives is shaped by the story of the gospel, the story of the God who calls us into his own kingdom and glory. And when this wonderful truth about God and about our salvation, about who we are in Christ, when this truth shapes our minds and our hearts, when it shapes our thinking and even our emotions, then we will increasingly walk in a manner worthy of God. And so let's continue thinking about these verses in 1 Thessalonians 2 in the upcoming week. God's word reminds us here that that we're saved by God's grace as a free gift, a completely free gift. And we're called to follow Paul's example of letting our lives bear witness to Christ. And we're motivated to live that way by the truth that we belong to the God who calls us into his own kingdom and glory. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we're so thankful 
for your love for us. Thank you for the grace that you've given us in Christ. Thank you for the gospel, which is absolutely free. We're just so grateful to know that Jesus died for us and that he rose for us so that through faith in him, we can be saved. And Lord, we look forward to that day that we're going to be with you, enjoying your everlasting kingdom. What an amazing thing to know that we will be glorified with Christ one day. And so we pray, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Lord, this world is crying out. This broken world needs you to return. And until then, Lord, would you help us to live lives that are worthy of you. Help us to walk every single day, every single moment in a way that glorifies you. Help us to represent you well to this world. Help us to honor you and please you with our lives. We love you, Lord. Would you deepen our love for you, deepen our walk with you, and be glorified in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. As we close this morning, I just want to um, encourage you to um, continue to, to, to look for the emails from church. We want to do our best to communicate with you during this time as we're not able to meet together in person. And so just keep an eye on um, those emails for, for prayer updates and for other uh, updates and, and communications from the church um, in the coming week. Let's go now with God's blessing. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.